Wonder World theme. Wonder World? Oh, gotcha. From? Beverly Hills Cop 3. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I'm Ash, and this is... Mike. And welcome to the Last Beacon Podcast. Today we're going to be discussing how the left's push for tolerance of taboo things is backfiring. Namely, LGBT topics in schools, as well as abortion. Uh, Obviously, Mike and I don't have any issues with any gay people or things that concern gay people. But uh, some of the stuff is just, like, over the top. Like, hey, little Susie, you like to play with the G.I. Joe, therefore you are trans. Or, you know, how safe, legal, and rare has become shout your abortion. You know, there's really... You just lay things on really thick, and then people resent these things. We saw a video where a girl on TikTok had posted her abortion live, and there was another Instagram or Twitter video that was going around where instead of posting a gender reveal thing, that's what it was set up as, you thought a girl was going to her doctor and getting a sonogram, it said, it's a, and it was boarded, and that was supposed to be really funny when really it's just sick. So, what has made this change happen Why do they think that abortion would be super popular? Why do they think it's a good strategy to pander so much to a group of people that, in terms of gay people, it was less than 10% of the population? 10% might be an exaggerated figure. I've heard that. Uh, In terms of trans people, it's less than 1%. Uh, I don't know why pandering to these groups will be... A successful strategy for them. Maybe they think they just have to be the wokest that woke can be. Woke, not broke. I think it's moral preening. If they're caring for groups they believe are uh, being victimized, they'll they'll be the saviors, and that the public will embrace them for it. Especially if, in the long term. That's where we all end up. They will uh, go from uh, virtue signaling to having been on the right side of history. And that's something that Ben Shapiro often points to, is they attack your morality. They won't listen to your facts because they can just say that you're just cold when you throw out these statistics that you don't care about people. You know, he says facts don't care about your feelings. But then he'll also say that if the only thing that will respond to is an attack on morality, you have to be better at arguing why your statistics back up real morality and why their so-called morality is really just BS and they're wrong and they're being cruel. So, to me, when you look at trans kids, you know, as the new form of Munchausen by proxy, it's actually an interesting take. That a lot of times, when you listen to parents, it just seems like it's more about them than it is about their children. Mike and I, at like a personal level, he could tell you that as my big brother, I looked up to him, I followed him around, and I wore all of his hand-me-downs. So when I was four, I wanted to be called Steve, and I was a super tomboy, like, the whole time we were growing up, and even now, I would say I'm a tomboy. If we can go play sports, I would rather be doing that than pretty much anything else. And I am very content to be a female as a grown-ass woman, so I'm glad that our parents, you know, I wasn't born like now, and then in 20 years I'd be Steve wanting to get back to being Ash, and it's a, it's a bad scene. I only called myself Steve because they said if I had been a boy, I'd have been Chris or Steve, and to me, Chris Dion just didn't sound right, and uh, it's funny because we actually have a cousin named Chris 
Dion. It's really unfortunate for him. But he didn't go by Chris. He goes by Christopher. And Steve Dion doesn't really sound right. Steven Dion. I, I don't know. I don't like it. I'm glad I'm I'm Ashley Dion. It's got a nice ring to it, even though Ashley's a cheerleader's name, I think. So that's why they always called me Ash. But back to the topic, it's the more they push even abortion, they say the younger generations, they're just rejecting this entirely, that kids tend to be more pro-life. Uh, you know, you'll see younger kids than, than we are, uh, middle school age, high school age, that are they have those signs at the March for Life that they are the pro-life generation. And the statistics are really are really staggering when you look at it. When we saw an interesting article, we looked it up to verify the stat on the LGBT education in schools, that 18% drop in uh, acceptance of LGBT kids uh, in the last two years among children. And I think part of it is that we grew up mostly in the 90s, when general tolerance was supposed to be the goal, color blindness, um, accept gay people, uh, or at least tolerate them. Intersectionality has a different tone to it. There's a real moral tone that the 90s didn't have, which is that you're sort of inherently bad if you're not one of these victimized groups and that you have to recognize it in a tone. Whereas in the 90s, tolerance was a goal, and if you did it, great. There's no real moral judgment there, except that you're a jerk if you're not tolerant, and that's very different to me. Something that's interesting to me, too, is that they claim that kids who watch Friends now are offended by it. I don't know if that's accurate or not, that it's really anti-gay and, and everything. But I think when you look at Ross's relationship with his ex-wife, it's like he'll make jokes because he's uncomfortable with the situation, but in there are scenes in which he feels like he's, it's like he's kind of trying. And there's other scenes where uh, Monica or somebody will be giving him a hard time like he's being intolerant. And I think it, the way that they use Chandler, where people think Chandler's gay, but there's also the episode where Chandler wants to be set up with somebody in the office after they had mistaken him for gay, and then he's insulted that they think he can't get the better looking guy in the office. To me, that's just like, you know, it wasn't done in, in 90 six or whenever that episode aired but it was kind of like there was nothing wrong with being gay and it was a funny funny take on it and people can say what they want about friends but to me it definitely paved the way for shows like will and grace you know um well abc was canceling shows that had gay characters uh to me it's it's really interesting that like from ABC, where all of those shows got canceled in the 90s. Later on, it was like ABC Family, where it's like, we're going to start that thing that Freeform later took on, where like, we're just going to inject so many gay people into these storylines that like, you're not even going to know what's going on. <laughs> so it's really, it, it was like snowball, but I don't, I don't watch Friends and think that Everybody on this show hated gay people. It's so offensive or anything like that. And even the jokes about like his dad cross-dressing and stuff. It was lighthearted. I don't think it was offensive. But to me, it's, it's crazy because kids should be able to ex just accept people. But we are getting away from people are people and... You know, regardless of what color you are, who you like, we should all get along with each other because they're breaking us down into these little micro groups. And what Mike points out often about how you get kind of points for being one thing and 
reduction in points for being another is what is making it really difficult for people because they're all trying to out-virtue each other and the virtue is coming for things from things that really have nothing to do with the way that we treat each other or behave morally and all to do with things that are intrinsic to us that we're born with. Indelible traits taking on a moral quality is dangerous, no matter who's in charge of that. As, as you said, it used to be that these were not things you can, could control, and to not care about them was the goal. And we've moved in a completely different direction. It's, it's almost like we're going to take historically powerful groups and try to get revenge. That seems to be the undercurrent. Now, they can't come out and say that, because that might actually be rejected. But this, it, it really changes the tenor, and few things cause people to identify as white, like attacking white people. They, they did a study I read about where if you say a bunch of positive things about white people, white people don't identify more as white. But if somebody says, I'm going to kill all white people, suddenly the white people think of themselves as white. And I just don't think this turns out the way that the intersectional crowd thinks it will. And it's interesting, I mean, like I have a human example of that. I had a friend who's actually from Mexico. When I say she's Mexican, I mean she was born in that country and came over and went to school here. And uh, when we were in high school, she said, all white people smell like popcorn. And I was like, what do you mean? She goes, they just do. They all smell like popcorn. And I said, do I smell like popcorn? She sniffed me and said, no, you must be one of the good ones. And back then, it's like, I'm not going to get offended by that. And I thought it was funny. But like you said, smelling like popcorn, you know, I smell popcorn and I want to eat it, but I wouldn't want to smell like popcorn as a as a general trait. I like to smell like, like nice, soft things that smell really clean. And uh, I had to just say, like, wait a minute, I'm an example of a white person. And I don't think I smell like popcorn. So what you're saying, if you say all white people are racist, or all white people are inherently bad or evil, or, or that we're inherently privileged, there's got to be a person that is living in one of the poorest counties in the United States who's like, hey, wait a minute, I'm super poor. I was born in a shack like Elvis, Tupelo, Mississippi, was that it? Yeah, and, and you know, I had to work my way up, or no, I'm still living in a shack in Tupelo, Mississippi, and I'm, you know, an outlier. There's, when they have those only anecdotal examples, they don't realize how easily um, one outlier can disprove your whole theory if you just generalize about everybody. But then they'll find a way that the outlier is, like, it doesn't count somehow. And you're right, uh, Jordan Peterson talks about the those naturally occurring hierarchies all the time. But he also points out how, you know, these these mini collectives that the left sets up is going to be their undoing. Really, if you are on the left, how can you rally around one set of causes, one more platform? You know, the Democratic Party, for example, if all you have done is create all of these little micro collectives on your own side there are going to be at war with each other all the time. That may work after you've already established a socialist government in America because a people who is not united will be more easily controlled. But you don't control us yet. You really don't. And you're just pissing people off. And you're making everybody pissed at each other. But look at the Democratic Party right now how fractured their voters are, you know, how many of them would say that they just would not vote for Joe Biden or wouldn't vote for Bloomberg? How many older people or the people that we're hearing from in South Carolina, black voters, um, I saw some of them interviewed today say, Bernie Sanders is crazy. This is not a socialist country, nor should it ever be. And they will not vote for him. And even if 
the entire platform has gotten socialist, they don't want that label even because that label is gross to them. I like the meme you posted today, and <clears throat> it talked about Bernie's uh, distinction. It's not socialism, it's democratic social. So there's something wrong with socialism, and it's just Bernie getting mad. Uh, but it's, it's true. It's, it's like any type of collectivism is bad, and he can rebrand it all he wants. He could say we can vote for it. It's all just bad, but the... The intersectionality is already starting to turn into cannibalism in many different ways, mostly on Twitter, which is not entirely real. But there have been situations, especially in the UK, where these groups butt heads against each other, and it's usually gays versus Muslims, and the Muslims tend to win. And to sort of bring us back around, uh, Klobuchar, during... Um the town hall that she held earlier this week was asked a question from the audience by a Democrat who was pro-life. And Klobuchar basically said what Pete Buttigieg said, which is, we don't want you. Like, we don't need you. We're going to be the pro-choice party. I'm sorry, but that's not going to be a winning strategy in the United States. If I could see real numbers about, you know, which voting-aged Americans are at least not in favor of late-term abortion and on, it would probably be a considerable amount majority did not favor late-term and infanticide and, you know, thought that abortion was something that should be avoided. If they think they're going to win with that, like, I think what you said was, why would you make that your hill to die on? Abortion doesn't seem to be it. Americans don't love abortion. It's kind of weird to me. They seem to want it so bad. They are fighting for something that seems to have no upside. Politically, they are driving the date that Americans are comfortable with back to first trimester, which has not really been a thing in our lifetime. We're getting back to pre-Roe v. Wade ideas of abortion. And it hasn't even been overturned, which I know that there was a thing, if Trump gets elected, they're going to overturn it. They haven't. There hasn't been a legal challenge to it, so they can overturn it. Uh, they can't just unilaterally decide that. But all the, the big takeaway for me is that you can't change culture really fast. Even if Lots of us agree that it should be. You can't force it. It takes time. And Martha McCallum just pointed out during that town hall debate, or not debate, really just, uh, you know, it was kind of like a debate because it was Klobuchar versus Brett Baer and uh, Martha McCallum. But all she pointed out was that as late as we abort babies in this country, these socialist countries do not abort them that late. We are way, way out there in, in terms of what we're doing. And I think the more we move away from common sense, away from science, the more people are going to resist. And that just happens naturally. Thanks for being with us.